would like to come to your listeners all over this nation and also to your listeners tuned in globally with a very, very important message here today. And I know I'm speaking right now to you and to your listeners in this country and also to your listeners tuned in globally. And I'm speaking to you at such a time when there is a severe wrath of God unleashed to the nation of the United States of America. I'm speaking to you at such a time when the hand of God is quite heavy, very heavy over the land of the United States of America. Very, very heavy. And... uh, I came on air the other day and spoke as to why the Lord God Almighty, the Lord Yahweh, the creator of the heaven and earth, had judged Texas, Houston, Texas, and by extension the United States of America, And we have seen very clearly that the prophecy, when it was spoken on that July 25th, the year 2017, that prophecy spoken on July 25th, 2017, a clear more than one month before All these things happened to the United States of America, the most powerful nation on the face of the earth, the nation with nuclear weapons, the wealthiest nation on the whole face of the earth, the nation with very organized systems of welfare, beautiful cities, top, the leading research institutions, their leader, their leader in aerospace research, leader in medicine, medical research, their leader in everything. They invest into research, the National Institutes of Health, National Institutes for Mental Health, National Institute for Alcohol and what? National Institute for National Cancer Institute, National Institute for Mental Health. So they invest and they have frontline research to improve the quality of life, to give assurance to the peoples of that nation, to the citizenry of their safety, of their assuredness on life a nation that has many satellites watching it from above the earth. And I spoke very clearly in that that prophecy. So we see now that that July 25th, 2017 prophecy was essentially the voice of the Lord thundering across the land of the United States of America. And you see, even now, to the teams in Nairobi here, the teams in Kenya that have been uh, responsible for putting together all this and enlightening the world on what is going on, why it is happening, those that are putting together things at the head offices in Nairobi, even they too have been taken by surprise because now they are beginning to learn the ways of the Lord, how the Lord speaks. Because when the Lord spoke about this, tremendous distress that was coming to the USA when he said the United States of America. So you see then Hurricane Harvey comes in a very historic way when Harvey comes. And then now you see now this Irma comes. And so every single letter of every word, they are waking up to the fact that every single letter of every word spoken into that prophecy delivered gravity. It had gravity to deliver to the people of the world and the people of the United States of America. 
I see the teams in Nairobi now grappling to understand the ways of the Lord, and globally too, how the Lord speaks. Because you see, when he mentioned the Americas, then he comes and sweeps through the islands also. When he mentioned USA, then he does not confine himself to Texas. Then he comes again, and you see what Florida is going on, is going through right now, what is going on in Florida as we speak at this hour. The largest evacuation in the history of that country, we call it the historic exodus. That's the news reportages say this is the most historic exodus ever since the United States of America was created. And we see that the Lord brought to contempt. He brought to contempt, to fatality, this prosperity, the accumulation of the wealth of the earth. Where now, you know, when the real moment to meet God arrives, then you find that people being interviewed in the media, they're saying, I could only run with our album of our wedding photos. I could only escape with my dog. I could live in big palatial homes. And, you know, in America, they have homes. They, they, they really have palatial homes, palaces, furnished homes, comfort, top vehicles, top lifestyle. But it, it was when it was time to run, so well now, you could not even run by road because the roads were clogged. Meaning, when the time to meet the Lord comes, the humankind will meet the Lord alone. No one will carry with him the things of the earth, the accumulation of the wealth of the earth. You see the little babies, their little baby rooms in the USA, full of millions of toys, thousands of toys, hundreds of toys to play with. They could not carry all those things. And so, why the Lord, God Almighty, has judged the USA. You begin to understand that the tornadoes he was talking about, you see the tornadoes that touched down in Tampa, in many other parts of Florida, hmm? the tornadoes that touched down in Texas, the floods. And you see, I was there. I was running for my life. After the pronouncement, the Lord now make me run for my life to make me feel what the people of that land will feel and run into higher ground. If you read, listen to that prophecy, run into higher ground. I want to talk about the real purpose of why this is happening across the face of the earth, whatever is happening now, why it is happening across the face of the earth. I want to talk about this this morning. Why is the hand of the Lord very heavy on the people of the United States of America? I will touch on it briefly, and then I'll come to the main theme, the main subject of this conversation the Lord is having with the peoples of the earth. And the book of Genesis, chapter 18, verses 20 to 22, I said already that many times the peoples of the earth, the nations of the earth, the way mankind navigates himself in fending for his life, executing his life on this earth, from day one when they are afflicted unto this earth by their mother, and there is a general tendency on this earth for them to drift to sin. That is now known, it is well established, everyone knows that the tendency of this earth is to sin. And I say it very clearly that many a time people may live in sin and heedlessness and the systems of heathenism, atheism, worldliness may take over their lives and communities and nations until they enter a state of complacency where they now feel comfortable in a small cocoon in some delusionary life as though there is no God Almighty, as though they are accountable to no one else. They don't have to give account to anyone else. They have no responsibility to be able to give account. And I say it, that in that state, that 
state is more like a lull, the lull before the storm. In that state, they almost feel like the Lord is not seeing what they are doing. I know that I have cried for the nation of the United States of America for so long. And I mentioned how I visited churches in Forest Park, Illinois. I visited, I visited churches in Oak Park, Illinois. In Chicago, the greater Chicago metropolis. I visited churches all the way, even the south side. Cicero, Polanski, Logan Square, Northwest Chicago. And visited churches in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City. Visited the Victory Christian Center, Oklahoma City. Visited churches. Many, many, many churches within Oklahoma City visited churches in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Churches in Norman visited many churches in Tulsa, Oklahoma and tried to engage the pastors there. Tried to talk to them about the changing of time. The fact that the Lord has now switched the clock and the spiritual clock of God in heaven now demands of us, demands of the house of the Lord, certain basic benchmarks, basic standards of the ordinances of God, righteousness, holiness, that the Holy Spirit is available to help us attain, to score those goals in Christian salvation in our own lives as we prepare for the coming of the Messiah. I visited churches in Midwest City, tried to clean up pornography in that church, and I could see everything happening, the pornography in the office, the magazines, the alcohol there. I could see the baptism pool upstairs, everything. I saw so much. As I entered every church, I had so much to tell them about cleaning up the worship, purging the worship, purifying the church. I went to churches in Dallas, Texas. I visited big churches, small churches in Dallas. I went to Bowie, Texas. Visited churches in Bowie, Texas, preached over there. Told them to change their ways. That the time now for a more worldly worship had come to an end. Visited churches all the way in Menahawk in New Jersey, Tom's River, New Jersey, all the way to Pennsylvania, close to West Point, Pennsylvania. Visited churches in Atlantic City. Many churches in that nation, in New Brunswick all the way to Camden. I visited churches there to try to dissuade them from the ways of the world. But this is not a thing that is exclusive to the United States of America. And that's why I'm very blessed to note that Kenya yesterday held a tremendous national repentance owing to this ominous conversation that is ongoing between the Lord and the nation of the United States of America. The entire church in Kenya they went into severe, severe repentance, serious repentance led by the senior archbishop himself. In sackcloth, people rolled on the floor, put their bellies on the floor. They cried out to the Lord. They asked the Lord to do everything and anything at his disposal to purify them, to correct them, to help them make amends, to infill them that the Holy Spirit may draw them closer and closer to the requirements of righteousness of the Lord to the definition of the Christian salvation that the Lord so beautifully earned for us on the cross. And that's why, you see, in Genesis 18, 20, 22, you see that now when the time, the fullness of time, the appointed time comes, then the Lord went to visit. The Lord himself now comes to visit. He goes down to Sodom and Gomorrah himself and visits there. And he says, I have come to affirm, to confirm, I've come to check it out, to interrogate, to inquire. I've come to, to probe, to investigate, to find out if the amount of complaint I have received is equal to the wickedness and sin and crime commissioned on the ground, then I will know. And you see, and then he came and judged the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And I'm using this as a standard introduction for Today's very powerful message that I want to give you, the, the blessed people that are tuned in, that you may be in the know of why all these things are happening. 
and they're happening so fast, so fast. Before I went on air with the earthquake in Mexico, it happened already. Everything's happening so fast. You can almost tell that the Lord is saying that time is over. The spiritual timeline has changed. Things are happening so fast. Anyone can tell what is coming. Anyone can tell that very soon there is going to be a big visitation on the earth. Even the magnitude, you can look at uh, the Hurricane Irma, the kind of trail of destruction across the Barbuda and all those islands, Puerto Rico, down bearing towards Cuba, and then turning around to strike Florida, which is ongoing until this moment. You can tell that time is out. Time is over. The Lord is speaking that things are happening real fast, too fast, too quick. And he says, In the book of Genesis, chapter 18, verse 20 says, Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and their sin so grievous. Verse 21, it says, That I will go down there myself and see it for myself if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. And that is so powerful because he essentially is telling us that many a times we may continue in sin, not knowing that there is the appointed time, the fullness of time, when God Almighty, our own Creator, would then have to compel us to give account. We we'll then have to use every means to get our attention to Him and to what he is saying. And this is what you see happening to the United States of America at this hour. When he would now have to compel us to account. And I said that the Lord is justified to do this. Because in so doing, in coming down to find out for himself. You see, on that July 25th, 2017, as I gave this prophecy of the Lord, as I spoke to the nation of the United States of America, little did they know that God the Father himself was actually trying to catch their attention, was engaging the land, was speaking with the nation, speaking with the church. It was God the Father himself who was cautioning them, who was saying, look, I love you this much. The people of USA, I love you this much that I wouldn't let you drift away eternally when time is over and the Messiah is coming. I love you this much that I would have to stop you and seek your, desperately seek your attention, shake you that you may now listen to me. And you see, in the book of Genesis 18, verse 25, he ends up saying, verse 25, he says, Far be it from me, to do such a thing, to kill the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you, from you. So again, let me read verse 25. Far be it from you, that is now Abraham talking to him. Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous and the wicked, and treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you will not the judge, in other words, the righteous judge of all the earth, Do what is right. Judge righteously. And the Lord is saying that this is the hour when the righteous can stand in for the land. This is the hour when he requires of the church to stand in for the nation. But how will the church stand in for the land in the United States of America, in Kenya, in all over the world, in Britain, in South Africa, in Nigeria, in Morocco, in Ghana? all the way Dominican Republic, in Venezuela, and everywhere. El Salvador. I see El Salvador. I see your invitation. El Salvador. I see you crying. You want a visitation. You say, please, man of God, come. But how is the church standing for the land if there is no righteous? There is no widow that is going to church and mourning. A widow that is going to church and crying, and the outcry is so great, so grievous the sin, that a widow weeps, has no sleep, her tears cannot be wiped out. How can the righteous stand in the gap when there is no 
remnant that goes, for example, a widow that goes to church and tells the pastor, say, Pastor, I'm not young. Pastor, please preach from the word. Pastor, I'm not young. I have seen the worship team. There is immorality going on there. Pastor, I am not young. I see the women are dressing in nudity here. Pastor, they told the church, take control of the church. Pastor, stop the gospel of money. Use the Bible. Stop the comedy. If there is no widow, the outcry was so big. Somebody was crying for the house of the Lord. The days of Eli, the same thing repeated. Hannah, Hannah kept weeping at the temple door. She was weeping for the house of the Lord. She really wasn't weeping for her son. She was looking at the apostles in the house. And you see Eli comes and Eli asks her, why have you had too much to drink? Meaning it was normal in those days to see drunkenness in the house of the Lord. To see drinking of alcohol and people dr- getting drunk, drunkenness. There was drunkenness in the house. And Hannah was crying for the state of the affair. And said, Lord, if you give me a son, I will not. The 55 years, the rule of 55 years to service to the Lord will not apply. If you give me a son, I'll give him. She made a unique vow that spoke, bespoke her heart. It really spoke of the outcry in her heart. How she was crying for the house of the Lord. If you give me a son, I will surrender him to you for all the days of his life. And no blade will touch his head. That was a unique vow. But she saw the dysfunction in the house. This, the Lord is using this to say that this is the hour when the righteous need now to step out. The righteous church needs to step out and cry for the land and sorrow for the land, and weep for the land, and agonize for the land. The church, the holy church, is the light of the world. But how can the church in the USA, the United States of America, how can the church in that nation step in on behalf of the land when they don't even seem to understand what is happening now? They don't even seem to perceive that God is speaking so massively to the land. They have adopted the gospel of prosperity so much, so much into their bloodstream that they are not even able to perceive when the hand of God is on the land and it was won, July 25th, 2017. And I'm using this as an introduction to what I want to deliver today. The whole message, the entire message of this conversation the Lord is having with the earth. This big conversation, the resurrection of a dead decomposing corpse called Mama Rosa here in Chepartan, Pokot, rural Africa, the church in the village, in the wilderness now. This tremendous hurricane and flood that you see in the USA, and many, many other things that he that speaks with you has prophesied and come to pass. Genesis 11, 5 to 7, same thing. The Lord comes down to seek attention of these people, to catch their attention, to tell them, you cannot ignore me forever. Genesis 11, Genesis chapter 11, verses 5, all the way to verse 7, same thing. Many times you may forget. You may be caught up in a lifestyle of sin for some time and forget that we have to give account. We have a creator. Before I get to Genesis 11, it will be so powerful to bring to your understanding the fact that even Isaiah bemoans, bemoans Israel in like manner. When Isaiah said the donkey knows his master's manger, Meaning, owing to the goodness of the master and owing to the fact that the donkey goes on a daily basis to the manger, to the trough, and gets benefit from there. He says, the donkey feels a sense of obligation. And you know, the donkey is one of the most unwisest of all animals Jehovah created. 
And the Lord uses that to rubbish the wisdom of this generation. And he says, the donkey knows his master's manger, and the donkey returns to the manger, always returns, always goes back, knowing that when I go back, I always get benefit. I cannot let the Lord down. I cannot disappoint him. The donkey knows that whenever it gets to the trough, the master's manger, it finds straw and eats. And the donkey is able to tie the benefit of submitting to this master, the benefit, and says, and now synthesize that in its brain and mind and heart as a sense of obligation. So the donkey feels obliged that owing to the goodness of this master, I cannot disappoint. I cannot disappoint him. There are benefits. The benefits outright anything else. And he goes on to talk about the ox. Same thing. Look at the USA. The Lord has been good to you. And many other nations I'm talking about. It's not only USA. Many other nations of the earth. The Lord has been good to you. Look at the United States of America. You have a welfare system. You have health care. You have top hospitals. You have good roads. You have protection. You have things that other nations do not have. And only the Lord did provide that life to you, that goodness to you. But you never tied the benefit of he, the master, with that benefit and synthesized and processed it as a sense of obligation for you to submit to the master, to always go back, always go back to the master, to the first nation you built to worship the Lord. Genesis 11, verse 5 on, he says, But the Lord came down, that is the Tower of Babel, but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that men were building. Another moment, when he left them for some time, and then all of a sudden he comes down now. He says, For how long shall they continue in building this tower of rebellion in Florida, the tower of rebellion in Miami? In Tampa, Florida, how can they continue building? For how long will they build this tower of rebellion in Barbuda, in Puerto Rico, in the Dominican Republic, all those so-called paradiso, the islands of paradise, the paradise of sexual sin, all the way to the keys of Florida? For how long will you continue building this tower of rebellion in Texas? In Dallas, Texas, in Houston, Texas, in the churches of the United States of America. For how long will you continue building this tower of rebellion where the women dress as they want in the church, where the pastors preach a more earthly gospel, where homosexuality is acceptable, where people can cohabit without marriage, in lying, this kind of worldliness that you are spewing out there. For how long does that continue? And he's saying in the book of Genesis 11, verse 5, he says, There comes a time when the Lord would have to come down and seek your attention. Why? Because the prophetic timeline of God has clicked. It has clicked. The coming of the Messiah is now near us, and he loves you that much. And he says, verse 5, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. And after that, he disintegrated them. He broke them down. Why does he come down? He comes down because he's a righteous judge. He's a just judge. He comes down to execute, like I said, a judicial inquiry, investigation, interrogation. A divine tribunal took place on that July, July 25th, 2017, he comes to see the height of wickedness. He comes to see whether you've really perfectioned the art of sinning. And I say the same about Egypt. When you look at the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 12, Exodus 12, verse 12, verse 29, they speak the same thing. Exodus 12, verse 29, it says, at midnight, the Lord came down and struck all the firstborn of Egypt, from the firstborn of the Pharaoh who sits on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner who 
is in the dungeon to the firstborn of all livestock. The Lord at this point had to come down. But if you look at verse 3, rather chapter 3 verse 8 of Exodus, then you understand he promised to come down. He would come down to address the state of the land, the abuses in the land. The outcry was so high. The burden of slavery was so big. The outcry was so high. The Lord said, I have heard tell the house of Jacob, I have heard their cry. The slavery is so bitter and their slave masters, they, they, they're overloading on them. They're abusing them. Genesis 3 verse 8, he says, So I have come down to rescue them, my people, from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into the land, the good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. Hey. There comes a time when the Lord has to come down. There comes a time when the voice of the Lord has to thunder in the land. And it comes with lightning. I saw the thick dark cloud of Jehovah come over the United States of America at the east coast, the, the, at the beaches, with wrath. Immediately after Hurricane Heavy, then he came. He came there, and the Lord made me know it was wrath. I was in the office working. Then he told me I fell asleep like this. And then at that moment, he took me there, showed me how his cloud of glory, the cloud of God that visited Moses, that visited he that speaks with you here, he came with a rat like this. And I trembled when I woke up. There comes a time when the Lord has to come down to seek your attention. Why? Because the Messiah, the King of Kings, is coming. And nobody can ignore the coming of the Messiah. The book of Micah, Micah chapter 1, verse 2 to 4, describes the same thing. Isaiah 26. He says the same thing in Isaiah 26, 21. He says, see, look, the Lord is coming out of his dwelling to punish the peoples of the earth. This is his nature. He gave us the grace of our Lord Jesus, but that grace was never, ever intended for abuse the way you see the grace being abused in the United States of America. So having built that preamble for you, the peoples of the world, the people of the earth, now I want to walk with you step by step, step wise. Why? Why does the Lord Jehovah do this? And I have a very important message here based on the visitation of the Lord when the Lord visited me and took me to the throne room and showed me the ark of the new covenant of the Lord in the throne room of God in heaven. That's what I want to share with you. I want to anchor it down for you that you may now understand why all these things are happening on the earth and in a hurry. And I told you, even the earthquake in Mexico, before I went on air, every day I said, I need to go on air. I need to give this prophet. It happened. But the same Oaxaca in Mexico, they know me. I gave a 24-hour notice of earthquake in Oaxaca, and it took place the next day. I was in the hotel room. It shook me also violently. Why? Because I met all the pastors in Oaxaca, and I told them, the Lord is summoning your attention now to repent us. I even said so at Puerto Escondido and gave a 24-hour notice for earthquake. And I said, tomorrow by this time, if you don't repent, there will be an earthquake. So there is nothing more the people of the world need to confirm to them that the Messiah is coming, the clock has changed, and they need to repent turn away from sin and receive Jesus and enter the glorious kingdom of God when that day arrives. Asian tsunami. Mount Everest. Earthquake in Nepal. Zika virus in Brazil. Ebola virus in West Africa. The healing of HIV here. Creepers are getting up and walking, including more than 7,000 miles away in Porvo, in Finland, from Nairobi. And I said a creeper that's asleep, and the baby was asleep. Baby Amy. He's walking now. 
after all the sophistication of medical care in Finland, one of the most developed countries in the world, failed. So there is no other evidence the earth is looking for now other than to prepare for the coming of the Lord. So I am going to talk about why these things are happening. And I have this very important message when the Lord brought me to the throne room, his throne room in heaven, and at that place I'm going to share with you how the person of the Holy Spirit who was speaking with me there by the golden walkway where the cherubim of glory, the two cherubim, in Hebrew cherubim, of glory carrying the ark of the new covenant of the Lord, walking sideways, bowed down, holding the, the ark of the new covenant with the staves. And I described the design and the definition of the ark, put in the throne position, and the prayer, and how the person of the Holy Spirit takes his right hand, touch my shoulder, and he tells me to take my left hand, hold his shoulder, and then lift up my right hand, he lifts his left, and says, let us pray. And all that happens, how the cloud comes and sits, and the conversation takes place at the throne. Then behind the throne, the river, and the trees of life, both sides. I want to share quite a bit on that, but before I share on that very important and profound revelation, I want just to talk on this four cuts the Lord is having, shaking the nation, shaking the USA, shaking them to get their attention. Why? Because of the coming of the Messiah. So I really want to talk about the coming of the Messiah briefly before I discuss this big revelation I've not shared quite a bit. I want to share the events of the throne room on that day, the ark of the new covenant of the Lord, a tremendous message that came out of there. But before I do that, I want to look at the coming of the Messiah. The reason is shaking them, seeking their attention, shaking the nations of the earth, seeking the attention of man, the coming of the Messiah. And then after that, I will go into a profound conversation that conversation regarding the ark of the new covenant of the Lord in heaven and some new things will come out of there that I have not shared before. So the book of First Thessalonians chapter 4, that's where I want to anchor this conversation today. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17. And he says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ rise first. So you see, he says, on this occasion, on this matter of snatching the church, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with the loud command of God, the loud command of God, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And then he says, And the dead in Christ rise first, verse 17, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever and ever. Therefore, encourage each other with these beautiful words. Hallelujah. So in this conversation, why is the Lord shaking the nations of the earth? He's shaking them from complacency. He's shaking them from apostasy. He's shaking them that they may understand how he speaks. He's shaking them that he may get their attention and is using he who speaks with you to shake them, that they may be drawn to him, that he may deliver the message of Jehovah, the Lord Yahweh, to them regarding the coming of the Messiah. So I would like to talk about the coming of the Messiah then. And he says in this scripture that they are asleep in Christ Jesus. He says they will be the first to resurrect. And we know too well that just January, this year, January, he showed me the entry of the church into heaven, how they met the Lord in the sky, in the air, up here, and I described the whole narrative, how the Lord put me 20, 30 meters 
away from the entrance to heaven, and I saw how they were dressed, and there's a big message on the garment, the garment of righteousness, the garment of holiness, that all the citizenry of heaven must wear, the fine linen, bright and clean, lino fino, resplandeciente y limpio, in Spanish, the fine linen, bright and clean, that the church must wear. But he says here, stepwise, that those who will be asleep in Christ Jesus, meaning at the point of death, they were born again. At the point of death, they were repented Christians, repentant. Not everyone that said, I am a Christian and went to sleep or died, gets to resurrect and enter heaven. He says, those whom at the point of death, they were born again. They had received the Holy Spirit. He was helping them. They were living a righteous life, a holy life. They get to enter on that day. And the Bible comes out very clearly in Hebrews 12, 14 at the end. He says, for without holiness, nobody sees the Lord. No one will see the Lord. And so he says, in the chronology of the coming of the Messiah for the church, and we know this coming of the Messiah is now nearer. That's why such a massive shaking takes place. Almost one quarter of the earth shaken very violently in these hurricanes. And of course, everywhere now. He says, those who have fallen asleep in that chronology, in the cascade, those who have fallen asleep are the first to rise up, resurrect, and then be given glorious bodies. Be given glorious garment. He's talking about those who have fallen asleep in Christ Jesus. He's saying that when you live your life as a righteous person on this earth, you almost become like Simeon that you see in the book of Luke chapter 2. When Simeon waited to see the salvation that the Lord, the God of Israel, had prepared for the nation, the glory of Israel, he waited to see the Messiah. And when the Messiah came, it had been promised unto him that he would not die until he sees the Lord Christ. And you see the day when he lays his hands and he beholds, he receives the Messiah, holds him. He beholds, he receives the salvation of our Lord, the Lord Christ. Then Simeon says, now you can let your servant go. Simeon now accepts to go to death, to die without fear. Because the Bible says Simeon was a righteous man. The same thing is echoed here in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17. He says, they are asleep in Christ. Those who have fallen asleep, who have died in Christ Jesus. In other words, to them, death, death does not do a holocaust on them. Does not wipe them out. He says, they are merely asleep. How powerful to be righteous at this hour. How mighty to be shaken by the Lord through storm, through the hurricane, if he has to shake you, to catch your attention, and draw you to the holiness of Jesus. Draw you to this righteousness that the Holy Spirit has brought to the church, has come to facilitate the church to score, to attain. How powerful. He says, Death does not disturb them. Death does not wipe them out. Death does not finish them. Does not, they don't perish into death. He says they simply retire away. Those who are righteous. What a benefit even for the people of the United States of America and globally though. What a benefit to be holy and righteous. Even at the point of death, he says, they are not worried by death. He says, because on that day, he says they are the first to rise. When the Messiah comes, how powerful. So surely this call to repentance, the call that the Lord has called the United States to, the call that he has called the nations of the earth by extension to, the call to repent, the call to repentance, national repentance, that they may return to righteousness, is a worthy cause. Worthy cause. Because he says, they that are in Christ Jesus, if they die now before the Messiah comes, on that day they will be the first to be raised. Why? Because
because to them, they have simply retired out of the troubles of this world. Out of the wrangles of the life of this world. They have simply taken a rest from the world, a rest from the travail of this light, the sorrows of this world. That's what is reflecting there. They fear death no more for the righteousness they behold. In other words, they are asleep. They are merely asleep in Christ Jesus. And he's saying that in beholding righteousness, in embracing the holiness requirements of this hour, then if one dies, even before the Messiah comes, he says, they are still in Christ Jesus, in union with Christ Jesus, they are asleep in his arms. Hey. They are under his special protection, his special tender care, even when they are dead. Why? Because when the day that I'm announcing comes, they will be resurrected first, given glorious bodies, glorious garments, and they rise up to meet the Lord in the air. What the Lord showed me January this year, to meet the Lord up above the earth here, and meet him in his glory before the living are translated to meet the Lord too. How beautiful. They are simply asleep in his arms in Christ Jesus, in his special tender care, protection. He says their souls are essentially in Christ Jesus, meaning they are in his presence. Their souls are anchored to Christ even when they die. How powerful. And in so doing, because their souls, even as they die in holiness and righteousness, away from the apostles you see in the church in the United States of America, the church, the fallen church in Kenya, Nigeria, wherever the world, Europe, away from that apostasy. If you walk in holiness, he's saying, even if you died now before the Messiah comes, before the rapture of the church, he says, then your soul is not lost because you are under, you are asleep in the arms of Christ. Your soul is anchored unto Christ Jesus. You are under his power, so your soul is not lost. Neither are you losers. Have you lost anything? You know, in other words, he says you become the greatest gainers from death because now you will have been taken away from the wrangles of this life. You are simply under the tender loving care of Christ the Messiah, dead in Christ Jesus, holy, repentant, and righteous. So he's saying, therefore now there is no fear of death. Why? Because dying to you, who are righteous, is now again. That is why the Lord is shaking the United States of America. He's saying there's a great again here. That worldliness will perish you to eternal hell. Hearken unto my messenger now. I have sent you a messenger. Look, he foresees those things happening to you. And there is a message he has to dispense to you. He has to trump a message to you, saying, please stop for a moment. Listen to the voice crying out in the wilderness of Africa, in the village huts of Africa, in the rulers of Africa. The voice crying out and calling you unto repentance to prepare the way, the holy way for the glorious coming of the Messiah. And he says, it is worthy because for you now, whether you die now before the coming of the Messiah, death now is a greater gain. You become gain. You, you, gana. you, you gain from death. You earn. Why? Because it simply removes you from the borders and the cares and the wrangles of this world, and you are in his loving care, Christ Jesus the Messiah, the dead in Christ Jesus. You have died in Christ Jesus. Why? Because he says, because on that day you shall be raised up from the dead. And your souls are awakened 
from sleep. He says in the book of First Thessalonians chapter four, verses sixteen to seventeen, that on that day when God comes down, when the Lord Himself comes down to take the charge, He will bring with Him the doctrine of resurrection and eternal life to you and your soul. Hey. He says, it is beneficial to listen to this voice and repent at this hour and choose righteousness. It is really a gain. You become a gainer. You gain from death out of this. How powerful that this has overruled the fear of death. And in the church, in the body of Christ right now, we are handling the resurrection of a dead decomposing corpse that is Mama Rosa in Kenya here. How powerful. And I saw her already buried when I was in Helsinki, Finland. We are now preparing for a grand, grand, grand mega celebration and Thanksgiving service to celebrate the resurrection of a dead decomposing cup the greatest sign and wonder in the church. So when God comes down, when the Lord comes down on that day to take the church, he brings with himself the powerful doctrine of resurrection and eternal life. Hey. And now the body of Christ globally is embracing, is handling the resurrection of a dead, decomposing, smelly corpse that was oozing parts and name it and fluids and what and mucus decomposed, resurrected in the body of Christ in this land, but this is essentially for the entire body of Christ. Hey. Because when Christ was risen and resurrected from the dead, he became the first fruit. The first fruit for all those asleep I'm talking about. The hope for our salvation. The reason I'm saying it is worthy for the United States of America to be shaken by the storms, by the hurricanes, if it will take that for them to listen to this voice of repent and turn away from sin and receive the Holy Spirit and walk in righteousness and embrace holiness and prepare the way in your heart for the glorious coming of the Messiah. It is worthy. He says it is worthy. It's a worthy cause. Because he says, even if you died now then, you died now before the Messiah came, if you heeded this voice, then it's all right. Because he says, when Christ was resurrected, was risen from the dead, he actually became the first fruit huh? so for those that sleep from among the dead. Hey! First Corinthians I'm reading right now. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 18 on. First Corinthians, beloved people. First Corinthians, what an awesome time. The man of God has essentially submitted all the nations of the earth right now under the authority of the Bible. That is speaks and it's fulfilled. The Lord speaks fulfilled, shaking the nations and bringing them to submission. It would be disastrous. It would be tragedous for the land and the people of the United States of America to have been shaken by Hurricane Harvey and to have been shaken by Hurricane Irma and the people of the Caribbean and the Americas, name it, and then at the end of it fail to understand their message. Why is God shaking us? That is why I come to you today in the morning and night for USA. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 18. He says, and you can read from verse 13 if you so will. He says from 13, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead. Verse 13. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Verse 14. 
And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith, the people of the USA, the people of the world. Hey. Verse 15, which was my target on, more than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. Verse 16. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. Verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, empty, vain. You are still in your sins then. Verse 18, which really I wanted to begin with. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised. That's why I said the firstborn from among their sleep. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have been asleep, who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, and resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. Verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, each in his own turn, Christ the first fruit, then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come. So he's essentially saying, it is worthy. It is worthy to be shaken by the Lord at this hour, that you may hearken and heed the call to repentance. Why? Because this call to repentance and returning to righteousness overrules the fears of death. It is beneficial that God may shake the nations and get their attention on repentance and righteousness and the return to holiness and the living of a holy Christian life. Women dressing well, pastors in the USA preaching the right gospel of the cross and the blood, the true salvation of the cross, shining the gospel of prosperity, false prophets repenting and receiving the Lord and becoming obedient, God-fearing people, false apostles. It is worthy then. The book of Colossians chapter 1 Verse 18, same thing. He says Christ, Christ is the firstborn. The first, he says he is the first fruit from among the dead. The first fruit from those who have slept. So when you read First Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 and 17, it's so powerful. This is the hope. He says, therefore encourage one another with these holy words. That death has now been defeated. The church in Kenya is now handling the resurrection of the dead. Hey. Therefore, a testimony, a testament that those who are dead, those who are asleep, are dead in him, they are not lost. Neither are they perished. So Christ's death has essentially, and resurrection, has materialized in the church. We are dealing with the resurrection of the dead, decomposing dead corpse here. Therefore, the resurrection of Christ essentially became the confirmation to confirm the gospel of Jesus. That's why in the first 
Corinthians, I read, he said, how can we preach it if there is no hope that Christ already resurrected? It becomes the confirmation of the hope of the gospel. In other words, he's saying that when Christ died and resurrected, and thereby now coming back, and now shaking the nation to prepare for his return, that death and resurrection, the word of God, essentially made the word of God bring light and immortality to this generation. Hey. And John chapter 1, verse 1 only says, and that word became the light of the world. It became life. Life. Vida. So he's saying essentially that the resurrection of Christ Jesus, his death and resurrection of the cross, is our hope. Therefore, we need not focus on the earthly horizontal gospel that gives us no hope beyond the tomb. That's why he's shaking the nations now. That's why he's shaking the USA, the Caribbean, and name it. Because now there is a confirmation here that the resurrection of Christ gave us hope, gave us light, and promised us, gave us the doctrine of immortality, the doctrine of everlasting life. Hey. Light, life, and immortality, that we may now be the light of the world. Why? Because only righteousness can raise the threshold, can raise the shelf life, can convert the perishability of man into imperishability, immortality, incorruptibility. He's saying the light of God that now we receive by hearkening to the voice of the Lord at this hour, that has become the hope for resurrection on that day. For those that have died before he comes or are to die before he comes. I am going to touch on the living also, the living holy Christian. But right now, I'm simply following the chronology of the scripture, First Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 and 17. He gives a chronology there of the events of the day that causes the Lord to shake the United States, to seek the attention that they may go into national repentance and prepare for that day. Oy. That the resurrection of the Christ has become the confirmation for us, the believers, that all these things actually are brought to perishability. And now we have hope from the gospel that the word of the Lord that spoke it into being has now brought us life, immortality, and life. Understanding, in other words, when he says light, understanding, comprehension about our call to be Christians, the Christian calling. Hallelujah. It is very powerful to be righteous at this hour. It is very powerful to be holy at this hour. He's saying essentially that those who are asleep in Christ Jesus, they are in a glorious state. Because on that day when the Messiah comes, the day for which the Lord is shaking the nations to prepare, on that day when the Messiah comes and he comes above the earth here, and the, the dead in Christ are resurrected and they are given glorious bodies, eternal bodies, and glorious eternal garments, and they rise up like this to meet the Lord in the air, he's saying they are sleeping in Christ, they are glorious now because on that day, they will be glorious on the day of rapture. And yet they are resting in his arms, in his tender care, in his protection now. They are better than those who are walking on the earth now. I'm talking about those who died holy. Those whom at the point of death were living a holy life, a righteous life, a repentant life, shunning sin, zero tolerance to sin, facilitated by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, you see very clearly that in this scripture, the Lord is saying, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16, 17, He says, the Lord Christ Jesus, in his ascension, when he rose up, when he ascended into heaven from that mountain there, as the first fruit 
from among the dead. He is saying, essentially, that he did so that he may open the way for all. All those, and I'm focusing right now on their sleep in Christ Jesus, before I come to the living. He opened the way for them also to return, to be risen in the same way. He opened the way. While he is coming, look at this now, while he came in a very humble way, when he came to die for your sins, in a very meek way, very meek, very humble, probably an announcement to some shepherds around that area, an announcement to Mary, only Joseph got to know Mary, got to know, few people got to know about it. Very meek and simple way of appearing into the sin, into the spiritual landscape of this earth, of the church. However, his return will by no means be simple. So nobody can try not to prepare because his return will be thunderous. He will come like a triumphant king with pomp and color as a victorious and triumphant king. That is what the scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17, is preaching to the nations of the earth, preaching to the church, preaching to the world, preaching to the body of Christ. Hey. And he says, the Lord will come down from heaven with a great pomp and massive power and color from heaven with heavenly hosts. While the beginning, the incarnation, the first coming, when he came to die, he came in a meek way to be abused, to walk the byways, the dusty road, bring the gospel. However, he is to argue and involve himself in arguments with the Pharisees and the Sadducees to be, to be overweight, to be tired of arguing on a daily basis, arguments about the word. He says, the return of the Messiah, for which he is shaking the United States of America now, and all nations now, will by no means be simple, simple like that. He is not coming back to be abused. He is not coming back to go to the cross again. He is not coming back to argue with the Pharisees again. He is coming back as a triumphant king. I have seen him already. Now he has a crown. He has crowns. He comes back with great power, with great massive, great pomp and color, and the announcement of the throne of God. Coming from the upper heavens, coming down to meet the church. And right now I'm only focusing on those who are sleeping, Christ Jesus. Hey. And he says, the Lord himself will descend down from heaven with a loud command, a loud shout. But when he died and resurrected, the Bible says he used the same way. And that's why when the Lord showed me the, the, the taking of the church, the resurrection of the dead church, holy church, and then the translation of the living church, and all of them caught up in the air, I saw them pulled to one corner of the earth. One corner of the earth where the portal is open, and they entered. But we now are aware, we are smarter now, we are enlightened now, everybody knows where that corner is. Why? Because he says, when he ascended into the heaven, after his resurrection, he passed through the same material heaven, into the higher heaven. And in the book of Acts, the book of Acts chapter 1, he talks about it. The book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 11. Hallelujah. The reason he shakes the United States of America, the most powerful nation on the face of the earth, with nuclear weapons, with many satellites, with everything that other nations do not have. Then he shakes her, and they run away from their home. Why? to catch their attention to prepare for this day, that they may hearken to this voice and hear about repentance and turn away from the ways of the world and go back to their creator and receive Jesus and receive holiness and righteousness and shun evil and dress well 
and refuse and reject the falsehood, false apostles, false doctrines that are, you see, you see being preached in Houston, Texas, and everywhere. And I was there, all the way up to the Junction Mall, San Antonio, Texas, all those places. I made endeavors to get there. I really endeavored to reach every corner as much as, much as I could. Shaking the nation of the USA, the islands of the Caribbean, that they may reject that deception of immorality and apostasy. That they may listen now about the coming of the Messiah and prepare. This is the day for which he's shaking the nation. This is the message you cannot fail to get after you've been shaken that much. The book of Acts chapter 1, verse 11, he says, he says, men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, this same Jesus, who has been taken away from you into heaven, will come back. In the same way you have seen him ascend, go into heaven. Hey. He says that the same way he went, he must come back. And he says he will not come back until all things have been restored. And yet the time for his coming back has been set by the Father. Nobody knows the day. Nobody knows the hour. But the season we can see, even in the shaking of the USA, the Caribbean, and the nation. He says there would be a distress as has not been seen before across the nation. He says it is only through the restoration of all things, and that can only happen by repentance. The voice that is calling out to you, repent, repent, and receive Jesus, and turn away from sin, and embrace righteousness, and embrace holiness, for the kingdom of God is near. I have seen the coming of the Messiah. I have seen the Lord coming. I have seen the entry of the Holy Church, the remnant of God. In other words, in the book of First Thessalonians chapter 4, our reference scripture for today, verses 16 to 17, he says, After all things have been restored, the Lord will appear in his glory, and he will descend from the heavens and come into the air up here, into our space above the earth here. And he says, That appearance of the Lord in the sky above the earth will be with great pomp and color, great power, and the shout of the king, and the power and the authority of the king, and the shout and the authority of the conqueror, and the voice of the archangel will be unbelievably unfathomable. And he's saying the archangel will give the shout, that voice, brother, the voice of the archangel, as he commands all the heavenly hosts, all the other angels that attend the Lord, all the heavenly hosts will attend the Lord. They will attend him on that day. Hey, what a mighty day that no nation would like to miss, that no nation can afford to miss. No wonder the shaking of the nation, no wonder Hurricane Irma, no wonder Hurricane Heavy, Hurricane Jose, Hurricane, whoever you put it there, no wonder. He says, the heavenly host will come with great pomp and color. The shout of a conqueror, the shout of a victorious king on that day. It is a day that every nation must prepare for. And whatever it takes to catch your attention, to prepare for this, whether it takes Irma and takes heavy, then so be it. Let it be so. Hey. And he says that the archangel, he says in that scripture of the book of First Thessalonians chapter 4, 16, 17, the archangel will give a notice, a command, the voice, his voice of, he will shout the approaching of the Lord, announcing that, that, look, the Lord is approaching. 
And I have given that the particular words. I have spoken to the nations of the earth on live broadcast. That I know the particular words they will say. They say, look, the Lord is about to appear in the sky. The exact words, I've just given them to you now. The archangel will use that to give notice to the whole, the, 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 the involved, the, the holy ones, uh, the holy dead and now resurrected, and also the living holy that are translated, those whose ears are spiritual, who will hear this voice. He, say, he uses that to give a notice that, look, the Lord is now approaching. Look, the Lord is coming. Oy. He will give notice of his glorious appearance in great power that the judge is coming, that the Savior is coming, the Redeemer is coming. And he says, there will be a trumpet call. The trumpet shall sound, and it will be for the purpose of also awakening the dead. The voice will awaken the dead, but the trumpet too. Giving notice that, look, the Messiah is approaching. The King is coming. The Savior is approaching. So those who are in the dust of the earth, the one I am focusing on now, they are asleep before I handle the living. When they hear this, they will wake up because they will have been summoned. Wake up, wake up. Morning has come. Look, the Lord is now approaching. Look, the Lord is about to appear in the sky. The Lord made me hear those exact words, how they will be announced on that day. How awesome a generation to get to even know what the announcement will sound like for those who live in holiness, those who live in righteousness, whose spiritual ears will have been circumcised by the Holy Spirit. Hey. And he says at that point when the dead in Christ are walking, they will then be raised first, before the ones who are alive. He says, the dead will resurrect first. That is what that scripture says. I have seen this event. That's why I speak to you with this authority. The dead rise first. They are resurrected first and given glorious bodies. Before the living Christians who are holy are translated in Christ Jesus, beloved people. How awesome. How about those who will be alive? He says, those who will be alive will go through a tremendous event. They will go through, I'm talking about the holy Christians. The holy Christian believers. Those who are walking in holiness and righteousness. He's saying, when the dead will have been resurrected, woken up from their sleep, clothed with glorious bodies, eternal bodies that don't rot, don't fall sick, and given glorious eternal garments, then the living will now go through what I call a privileged event. They will undergo a significant change which is almost similar to dying and resurrecting. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, they will go through an event which is almost equal to an instant pia pia, an instant dying and resurrecting. Why? Because then they have to be changed from their mortal realm to the immortal, imperishable realm. He that speaks with you now, I remember when the Lord was coming, when he was coming, or whenever he's coming, the three times he has done it, whenever he wants to come and transfigure me, in the dream before that happens, before I give the prophecy. He already comes and transfigures me. And he changes me from this realm to the heavenly realm. Yeah. And then in a flash like lightning, then he transfigures me back. So there is the crossing over. There is the overruling of the realm of death. The, you said to, to overrule, to cross over, to cross the death barrier. I have seen that severally. The three times he has transfigured me. Even when he was calling me and he killed me, when he killed me and then resurrected me at the time of calling me before he commissioned me. Again, at that time, I saw him 
overrule death. I saw him take me from the mortal realm and then cross the death barrier into the imperishable realm, the immortal realm, and then the person of the Holy Spirit came and spoke with me. Then he said, from today on, the Holy Spirit is your only witness. And then again, he transfigured me back to the living realm, but this time he put me in another body. Because the other body, in the manner of killing, he crushed my body in that dream. So he put me in a newer body. Hey. He's saying, those who are alive and will have been walking in holiness and righteousness as Christian believers, they will undergo a significant event, a change similar to dying and resurrecting. Because they will be changed from their mortal realm to the immortal, imperishable, eternal realm. Hey! Isn't this worthy enough for the Lord to use Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Heavy to shake the nation of the USA to catch their attention to prepare for this significant event? Surely the Lord is justified. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Look at what he says here. He says, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, beginning from 50, he says, verse 50, I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the perishable. Verse 51, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we'll all be changed. Meaning, when the Messiah comes, and the dead in Christ are the first ones to be resurrected by the voice that wakes them up. Look, the Lord is about to appear in the sky. And the trumpet call, and they wake up. And they are given in that resurrection eternal glorious body. And they are given glorious eternal garment. And then he says at that point, the living Christian, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 51, he says the living Christians will undergo a process similar to dying and resurrecting, crossing the death barrier for those who will be holy and alive as Christians. Meaning, he says, that event will be a mystery. Until now it is a mystery. The same as the transfiguration of he who speaks with you that has happened in Helsinki, happened at the Riverside Drive in Nairobi, happened in Kisumu. In all those times, it is a mystery. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a mystery, in an event that is similar to dying and resurrecting. Dying in the mortal form, resurrecting in the immortal, in the immortality. Hey, isn't this worthy enough for the Lord to shake the Caribbean, to shake Houston, Texas, and shake Florida, the island, the Sodom and Gomorrah, the present-day Sodom and Gomorrah, the Caribbean islands, Florida, where you have homosexual gay parties. Hey. Isn't this worthy enough for the God-loving American also to hear this and prepare for this day that they may say, well, you use the hurricane to shake us, use the hurricane to shake us, but it was worthy because you are woke us and we were awakened in our souls and we prepared. Look now, we are in the eternity of God. We are now enjoying eternity of God. Hey. In other words, he's saying, for those who will be alive, their mortal bodies will undergo a change and a conversion, a translation into the immortal realm, which is the flesh and blood being destroyed. Why? Because he says, flesh and blood are not capable of undertaking the eternity of God, the immortality of God. Hey. And he says, those who are in Christ Jesus now, we have the, those who have been asleep in Christ.
Christ Jesus and the living Christian holy, now we have the two meeting Christ in the air. He says, they will be taken up in the rapture and they will meet the Lord in the sky, in the clouds, in the air above here. Why? For the Lord to congratulate them. There will be a tremendous celebration above the earth here. You don't want to have remained on the earth on that day. That's why the Lord is justified to shake the nations, to catch their attention, to listen to this voice, preparing the way for the glorious coming of the Messiah, the Redeemer. That on that day, when the, the dead Christians who are holy are woken up and resurrected in glory, and the living holy Christians are translated in a mystery to meet the Lord in the air, and the celebration takes place in the air above the earth here. You may not miss that celebration when the Lord will officially congratulate them. Thank you, my good and faithful servant. Hey! That is where they will get the word. And I want to take a short five minutes worship break, after which when I come back, I want to handle this celebration that will take place above the earth. The reason the Lord is shaking the USA and many nations, that they may not be remained, may not remain on the earth when that celebration will take place above the earth here. The Lord, the Redeemer, the Conqueror, the Savior, the Victorious King, coming back to congratulate those dead Christians who are holy, and the living were wholly translated and congratulating them in the sky above the earth. A big ceremony of celebration is about to take place above the earth. Listen to me, the nations of the earth. I have seen it already. This year, January, on January, the Lord showed me the church in the air above the earth in a big felicitation, jubilation, and celebration as they prepare to enter heaven. I would like to continue from where we stopped when I was talking about the reason the Lord has to seek the attention of the busy nations. The nations of the earth right now are very busy sending. They are busy with life. But the Lord has now to seek their attention, to look for their attention that they may listen to him. And uh, this, I said, um, might involve and will involve shaking them, uh, might involve the hurricane, whatever the way. And I said, that there is a very significant event that is about to take place above the earth here at the point when I finish the first segment. And I say it's worthy that the Lord should shake the nations that they may not miss that event. I brought you step by step and stepwise up to the place where now we saw that when the dead in Christ Jesus will have been awoken by that shout of the archangel, look, the Lord is about to appear in the sky, warning on the approaching king, coming with pomp and color, coming with all the heavenly hosts, attending his presence, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ, whom I said are those who are holy, those who will have chosen holiness, when they are eventually resurrected from the dead, those who died as they were holy and righteous, they had repented of their sins. And he says, when they will have been resurrected and given their glorious bodies. In other words, during the death, we say, it, when they are dead, they are simply asleep, and they are asleep in the arms of the Lord. The way a little baby sleeps, in your arms as a parent, under care, the care and protection of the Lord. And so, uh, we saw very clearly that they are now awoken, 
They are given glorious bodies, a glorious garment, eternal bodies, eternal garment, and the living also. Then they go up in the air to meet the Lord. However, he says, the living, those who are alive, the living Christians who will be living in holiness, they will be alive. And these are the repentant Christians. The church, for example, the type of church you see in Kenya here, that every moment they repent, they are, they are seeking righteousness, they are asking all the day, all the time at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., how can I be holier? What is it that I'm not doing? How can the Holy Spirit help me? There is an awakening by the Holy Spirit on pursuing righteousness. They have made a deliberate effort to pursue holiness. They are looking for ways of living for it. They are quitting jobs sometimes when a job is compromising their salvation. It doesn't matter how great the salary, the work, the remuneration. Hmm? They quit it. And you see, you hear him saying, well, I wanted that job. Oh, I was working that job. But because I, I, I found out that he's conflicting with my salvation, I said, well, this is easy. I don't have to be a genius. I quit it. And I continued. Now I'm looking for another job. It doesn't matter. Well, it takes me some time, but it's all right. I have chosen eternity. I don't want anything to defile my holy salvation. That type of church is saying the living Christians who will have been walking in holiness, their souls have been awakened to sensitivity, sensitized on the matters of righteousness, on the requirements, the holy requirements of the Lord. He's saying that holy church that pursues righteousness, they are conscious of their dressing, their women. They know that they have a greater responsibility. They cannot just dress anyhow, cannot expose their chest, cannot expose their anatomy. Cannot. They are very sensitive on how they execute their salvation. They are deliberate to look at them. Whether they are university students, you find that these ones have totally chosen the Lord without care. They don't care about the mass, the multitude. They separated out for the Lord. He's saying that that holy church, which is alive at that time also, will undergo an event which I said, the Bible calls it a mystery. A mysterious event which is equivalent, it is synonymous with dying and resurrecting. Equivalent to dying and resurrecting. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. However few they will be, and he says they will catch up with those dead asleep Christians that had been woken up, glorified, given glorious bodies, rather, and take, they will catch up with them in the air, and the tremendous event will take place up here above the earth. And I have been taken above the earth. I have lived that day. The same way I lived the hurricane heavy, and the same way I lived hurricane Irma coming to the USA and spoke about it earlier. The same way I lived, all these events are prophesied and come to pass. The same way I lived the creation of the planet above the earth and four moons above the earth after finishing the planetary zone, go to another stratosphere above there and have create another planet. The same way I lived that until it was fulfilled after 38 days is the same way I have already lived this day this event that will take place above the earth here. And I say it, that when they are taken up, the Christians that were dead and holy, asleep and holy, the living Christians, these ones resurrected, given glorious bodies, these ones translated, they almost go into a, a mysterious event, almost death through something similar to dying and resurrecting, dying in the mortal, resurrecting in the immortality. When they come to meet the Lord in the sky, there is going to be a big celebration and congratulations, thanksgiving ceremony that will take place up above the earth here. And he says that congratulation and celebration and thanksgiving ceremony, celebration that will take place above the earth here, is exclusive for those who have lived in holiness and righteousness, those who repented of their sins and received Jesus, Christ Jesus the Lord, and so they are now taken up. He says, meanwhile, the rest that have not been holy will remain on the earth. And he is saying, the Lord is saying, that that is the reason he is compelled to use he that speaks with you to shake the nation 
very violently in order to attract their attention to this point that they may be forewarned to forestall a tragedy, a calamity, a catastrophe when they will fail to partake of that event, that to shake them and catch their attention now, that they rather prepare now and be part of that event after a shaking than to be left in complacency and then perish into eternal hell. And he says that when they are taken up in the rapture and they meet the Lord in the sky, in the air here above, in the clouds, in the air here above the earth, it will be a congratulation ceremony. He says, this is when the recompense, the reward, the rewarding of the saints, according to what they have done, will take place up here. And it will be a shocking celebration, a historic celebration, as has never happened before. Why? Because for the first time, the following events take place. The fruit of the cross for the first time has been snatched away from the wrangles of this life, from the snares of the enemy, from the deluding of Satan, and finally they are now taken up. And he says, that is the place where the Lord will congratulate them from. I'm now reading the book of Revelation 22, verse 12. And he says, Behold, I am coming soon. For all those tuned in by radio all over the world, this is the event for which the Lord is seeking the attention of all men and all the nations. This is why he used me, he is using me even now to shake Florida, to shake the United States of America. That's why I won on July 25th and broadcast it live on YouTube globally. And then my words are right now being fulfilled in the United States of America, word for word. When I said I see myself running, I see people panic running, then you see almost 6.5 to 7 million people fleeing from Florida. Historic. When I said I see water coming from the ground, meaning ground level, it may be rain also later, but you talk about from the ground. Then he meant the ocean, and you see the ocean came out. When I said I see tornadoes, then you see tornadoes, tornado watches, and several tornadoes have touched down in Florida. He's saying he's shaking the nations. Why? Because there's an event, a historic event, an irreversible event, an event that nobody can afford to miss, that is about to take place up in the sky here, above the earth here. And only the holy will partake of that event. It will be a congratulation ceremony, a thanksgiving ceremony, a celebration ceremony. And he says here, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Earth. And he goes on in 14 to say, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and go through the gate. Very powerful, beloved people. There is a ceremony up here. And he says, when the dead in Christ and the living in Christ, holy and holy, when they are taken up in the rapture to meet the Lord in the sky here, in the air, above the earth here, they will have a ceremony, a glorification ceremony. They will have a glorification ceremony when they will be glorified. In other words, they will receive the crown of glory above the earth here. Nobody on earth deserves to miss this. Nobody. Regardless of which nation. Whether you are in an in Islamic nation, you ought to be born again at this point. 
receive Jesus and prepare for this. You cannot afford to miss this. They will be given and they will receive in that ceremony glorification, the crown of glory. And at that time, there will be the biggest celebration and festivities, celebration of the raptured saints as they finally meet the Lord. Finally, they will meet the Lord, the God that redeemed them on the cross. They will finally come to meet the Lord at that place. Finally. Finally, the reason they celebrate so big is because finally they get to meet the Lord face to face. Face to face. It will be a tremendous ceremony, a tremendous celebration to finally meet the Lord face to face. Nobody wants to miss this. If it has to use a hurricane to shake the United States of America, to draw their attention to this upcoming ceremony, that they may not miss it, then so be it. Hey. And he says, the Lord himself, in that scripture, First Thessalonians, Chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. It says, And the Lord himself will come down, implying that he will come down himself. He won't send nobody anymore. He will come down himself. He's not sending anyone this time around. Hey. And he will come down with pomp and color. With pomp and circumstance. With heavenly hosts accompanying him, attending his coming. And he will come down as a conqueror, as a king with a crown. In other words, he will come down in his majestic power, in his majesty. Hey. And the church will meet him face to face. He will come down in his person. The presence of the person of the Lord, you will be able to see him in person on that day. Hey. Man of Galilee, why do you stand here looking in the sky? Know ye not that the same Jesus who has been taken away from you into heaven, into the skies and heaven, will come back in the same, he will be back. Coming back with pomp and color, pomp and circumstance, with heavenly hosts as a triumphant king, a king of victory. The one who is now victorious, and you can see now how he has earned victory for the church at that place. It will be a celebration like none before. Some of you, I don't know what you'll do. You'll kneel down, you'll lie down, you'll jump up, you'll celebrate, you'll fall on the floor. I don't, you'll see in the sky here, 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 above the earth. I have seen that event. The Lord has shown me that event. And he says, the shout, there will be a shout, as we have seen. I have given you the exact words of the shout that will warn, that will awake the people, awake the holy asleep, and awake, enlighten the holy living, the shout. He says, that shout is a signal. Señale in Spanish. That is supposed to be a sign, a signal. It's a shout of war. It is also a shout of war. Why a shout of war? Because it will be a shout that gives command on the final assault. The final onslaught against sin. The final victory. The final conquering of sin. The final triumph over sin. Why? Because for the first time now, the church is away from sin, has defeated sin. We know very well from the meeting in Menengai, the meeting that took place in Nakuru in Kenya here, August 2016, last year, beginning 26th of August all the way, 
to 29 those three days. You know that the Lord had spoken to me about that meeting and shown me that meeting before. And he showed me that one would come from heaven flying with wings when the fire of Elijah would come, when he, when he would call, when I would call for the fire of Elijah to come to the meeting and come and suspend above the altar, the one that was coming from heaven would come with wings and have a trumpet. That's why I feared. I thought he would take the church from Merengai. Hey. Why? Because we know it very well that every time there is a trumpet, apart from the shout, the trumpet, the shout of the throne, but the trumpet, the trumpet usually alert our companies. It comes with the revelation of God himself. The revelation of God. Revelation of God. The book of Exodus chapter 19 verse 16. Exodus 19 verse 16. This is what he says about that trumpet. Exodus 19 verse 16. And he says the following. Again, Exodus chapter 19 verse 16, beloved people. He says, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast and everyone in the camp trembled. When the trumpet blast happened, that is when now God descended, God arrived, arrived on Mount Sinai. So the trumpet blast is always that which accompanies. It's a sign that God has arrived. It accompanies the arrival of God all the time. All the time. The trumpet blasted and the presence of God himself arrived on Mount Sinai, beloved people. There was thunder, there was lightning and everything. But when the trumpet blasted, then the revelation of God took place. God was revealed. God appeared. The book of Psalms 47 verse 5, it says, God has ascended amid shouts of joy. The Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. The sounding of the trumpet always accompanies the revelation of God. The arrival of God himself. So you can see that above the earth here, now when God will arrive, there will be that sounding of the trumpet. That's why in First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17, he talks about the shout, a loud shout, a loud command, and he said the voice of the archangel, the trumpet sound. That trumpet is what I'm talking about now. Signaling the revelation of God, the arrival of God. That is what will happen above the skies here. But we know from the way the Lord commanded Israel, He always commanded Israel on certain occasions to sound the trumpet. And you will see very slowly here that those functions of the trumpet sound are accomplished above the sky here too. God's ways are the same. They are in the Bible. He says the trumpet sound is also in Israel meant to accomplish certain functions. I am reading now from the book of Numbers chapter 10 verse 10. Numbers chapter 10 verse 10, beloved people. The sounding of the trumpet above the skies on that day for which the Lord has used me to shake. The United States of America using Hurricane Heavy and Hurricane Irma and name it violently ongoing now in Florida. That you may not miss the reason why God has shaken you. Hey. The book of Numbers, beloved people, Numbers chapter 10. 
Numbers 10 from verse 2. We can take verse 10. Let's start verse 2. He says, Make two trumpets of hammered silver and use them for calling the community together and for having camps set out. He's saying, Make trumpets and use them for summoning a holy assembly of the Lord. For summoning the community together to observe a holy convocation unto the Lord. And on that day for which the Lord is shaking the nations, the day that I'm announcing to the nations of the earth that they may repent and prepare, the day for which he is violently shaking the USA right now, that he may get their attention, that they may hearken to this place and get to prepare not to miss the event above the sky here, above the earth here. He's saying, when that day arrives, he will sound the trumpet that you see in First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17. And the purpose is to summon a holy convocation, a holy assembly of the dead in Christ who are holy and the living in Christ that were holy, that they may observe, assemble, and gather, and observe a holy assembly above the earth here. There is a ceremony here. Hey! Hey! The sounding of the trumpet on the day of rapture. That he may summon forth a holy assembly of the holy elect, the holy saints of God. Those who are dead in Christ Jesus, holy. Those who are living Christians, holy. Not dressed like immoral prostitutes. Not dressed in what, what. Not in the gospel of prosperity. Not in the lies of false prophets. Those who are walking holy on the earth. And those who are holy at the point of death. He says, the trumpet summons a holy assembly above the earth here. Hey, how mighty. Numbers chapter 10, verse 10. And he says, Numbers chapter 10, verse 10. Also, at your times of rejoicing, you are appointed season and feast and new moon festivals, you are to sound the trumpet over your, hallelujah, over your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, and they will be a memorial for you before the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. Hey. Also at your times of rejoicing and celebration, you are to sound the trumpet. <laughs> so when the trumpet sounds in the book of First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17, it does not only summon a holy assembly up here, but also it is a sounding, it is sounded to bring forth the understanding that right now, this is the time for a major celebration above the earth here for those who have been raptured. Hey. For the celebration for the crown, the glorification of the raptured saints. This is when the crown of glory is being given them. And then they now take the reward, the recompense, the reward for eternal life. Hey. Numbers 31 verse 6, the other function of the trumpet that will sound, the event for which the Lord is shaking the United States of America to get their attention and all the nations, that they may not miss, that they may be found ready. Muy, muy listo in Spanish. To be found ready. Numbers 31, beloved people. And he says, verse 6. Moses sent them 
into battle a thousand from each tribe along with Phinehas son of Eleazar the priest who took with him articles from the sanctuary and the trumpet for signaling. Hey! They fought against the Midian and the Lord commanded Moses. So look at this now. Even at the time of war, the trumpet was to be sounded. Moses sent them into battle a thousand from each tribe and he says along with Pinehas son of Eleazar the priest who took with him articles and he says among the things he took from the sanctuary were the trumpets for sounding during war and I said that when the trumpet will sound above the earth here it will also signal the final assault on sin, the final onslaught on Satan, because on that day, the Lord, the victorious King, the triumphant Lord, the conqueror, will defeat sin forever. He will take the church, and nobody will take the church again. Hey. And I would like to bring to your attention this rewarding ceremony up here. The book of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 10, talks about it too. Isaiah 40, verse 10. This ceremony of reward, recompense, congratulations. Isaiah 40, verse 10. Isaiah 40, verse 10. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him, and he will recompense according to him. Isaiah 62, verse 11. Nobody wants to miss that ceremony of recompensing. The reward ceremony. No one, no one ever wants to miss that. Isaiah 62, verse 11. The Lord has made proclamation to the ends of the earth. Say to the daughters of Zion, See your Savior cometh, see his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. Romans chapter 4, verse 4. The ceremony that takes place above the earth, beloved people. Romans chapter 4, verse 4. Let's see what he says here. Romans 4, verse 4, he says, Now, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. The same Lord who says in Deuteronomy that do not hold back the wages of the workers, how will he fail to reward you then? Deuteronomy 24, 14 to 15. The ceremony that is about to take place above the earth, beloved people. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 14, 15, verses 14, 15. How awesome that you may now understand the revelation on the prophecy of the storm that struck the United States of America, the earthquakes, the Zika virus, all the Ebola virus, all the shaking, the shaking of Mount Everest, Nepal, the earthquake in Italy, all these wonders, the resurrection of Mama Rosa, the revelation of these wonders of the age. Deuteronomy chapter 24, 14, 15. He says, Do not take advantage of a hired man who is poor and needy, whether he is a brother Israelite or an alien living 
in one of your towns. Pay him his wages each day before sunset because he is poor and is counting on it. Otherwise, he may cry out unto the Lord against you and you will be guilty of sin. The Lord that commands the paying of wages, how can he fail to recompense, to reward your persecution, your withstanding of trials, your perseverance in holiness, your steadfastness and travail in righteousness, your rejection of the tide of the wave of sin. How? He will pay you, he will reward you. Hebrews chapter eleven twenty six and Colossians three twenty four talk about the same reward. But remember, further on, after the rapture, there will be another paying according to what you have done. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2. There will be another rewarding ceremony too. Being rewarded according to what you have done. But that comes later after the rapture. Later on when the raptured saints come back with the Lord unto Jerusalem. For if the message spoken by the angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received is just punishment. Hey. There will be another recompensing, paying and giving according to what they have done. Where the wages of sin will be death. But I am not talking about that. I'm only saying unto those that have heard and hearkened and prepared. To them await a reward. A reward awaits. Isaiah chapter 3 verse 11. Woe to the wicked. Disaster is upon them. They will be paid back for what their hands have done. There is another ceremony that will take place. But I'm talking about the ceremony for the elect of God, the holy saints that are raptured. However, he says, there will be another ceremony. Another ceremony bewait those who are not part of the holy convocation and celebration that will take place above the earth. And he says, in the book of Romans chapter 6, verse 23, he says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is the eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, the Savior. So there will be another ceremony, but I'm talking about this major ceremony that is about to take place on the earth here. Celebration, felicitation, historic jubilation, when they are sleeping, Christ Jesus, resurrected, glorified, given glorious bodies, those who are alive and holy, also Christians, taken up to meet the Lord in the air, in the sky above the earth. Hey. And he says, and therefore they will be with the Lord forever. Meaning, they will be united with Christ. And now you will have one body, the body of Christ. From the dead saints, now resurrected and glorified, the living holy saints, now translated and together, one body of Christ with the Lord himself, face to face. Meeting the Lord face to face. The raptured saints, the holy elect, the raptured elect, and that's why it is very critical beloved for the nations to prepare that when that ceremony takes place above the earth nobody miss it he will come back to Jerusalem in Revelation 1 7 I've read it across the earth but that is another day I'm talking about this mega celebration above the earth 
and he comes with the clouds in triumph, in victory. And when he comes with the clouds that you see mentioned there, the clouds, let's go to the book of Psalms 104, verse 3. I've read verse 2 to 4 all over the earth. When I am describing the visitation of the cloud of God, I have read the book of Psalms 104, verses 2 to 4, all over the earth, from Namibia to Helsinki to Finland to where? Everywhere. Psalm 104, beloved people, why he comes with the clouds? The tremendous clouds of God. The cloud of Jehovah. This is what he says. He says, or I can begin verse 2. He says, he wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and he lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariots and rides on the wings of the wind. He is coming triumphantly with the chariots. A king comes with chariots. And he's saying that is the reason he comes in the clouds. Hey. Just above the earth and the air. They will meet the Lord now, as I've said. They will meet the Lord. He comes with chariots. Chariots. The clouds are the chariots of the Lord. How powerful it is. A triumphant king. A victorious king. He is not coming back to preach the gospel again. When I look at the church in the United States of America, I see a church that is behaving as though Jesus is coming back to preach the gospel anew and go back to the cross. It's as though they are crying for a second deliverance. That will not take place. Hey. It will not take place. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the great groom. Hey! Into the sky. At midnight, the cry rang out. Here is the bridegroom. Come and meet him. Matthew 25. The saints that are raptured, the church that is raptured, will meet the Lord in the sky, beloved people. And it says, hence, they shall be with the Lord forever and ever. Meaning, sin will never touch you again. In the USA, all over the world, even Kenya here. Oh, I have cancer. Pray for me, cancer of the throat, cancer of the stomach. I have cancer of the lungs, cancer of the liver, cancer, cancer. Those sorrows will be no more. Because you will be with the Lord forever and ever. Forever and ever. Revelation chapter 3, verse 11, he says, and verse 12, 11 to 12, he says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Hey, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. He was here. Let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord says to the church. Hey. I begin 11 again. Revelation 3, 11 all the way. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have. Hey, but you received it from Calvary. And many of you in the USA have lost it because you have diluted it and adulterated it with the modern living. He said, no, hold on to the holy gospel of repentance and holiness and eternity and overcoming sin 
and deliver us the gospel of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of resurrection that I gave you at Calvary, so that no one will take it away from you. In other words, no one will take your crown away from you. Hey. And he says, Him who overcomes, I will make an eternal pillar. A pillar in the temple of my God, the eternal temple of God. Never again will he leave it. Hey. And he says, I'll write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I'll also write on him my new name. And that's why in the book of First Thessalonians, he says here very beautifully, First Thessalonians, beloved, he says here, chapter 4, First Thessalonians chapter 4, 16, 17. Verse 17, he says, After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Why? Because that is the church that has overcome sin. They have persevered the travail. They have rejected the sexual immorality of this world. You turn on every TV, immorality. Every commercial, immorality. Every street, immorality. Everything about this world is immoral now. But he's saying there will be a remnant of God at this hour that will shun evil and they will choose to stand and live unto the Lord. To be holy no matter what it takes. In other words, he's saying, they will never leave the Lord anymore after this ceremony. The dead will be at the same advantage point as the living anyway now. In any case, they were better than the living when they died in holiness. So they are not going through the wrangles and the snares of the devil that are greater and greater each and every day we live. This is the message, the message of the big celebration felicitation and jubilation that is coming up above the earth here. This is the message that the Lord had in the storm. The hurricane Harvey and the hurricane Irma, the earthquake in Mexico, earthquake in Mount Everest, earthquake in Italy, all these things, the resurrection of Mamarosa, all these things you have seen, HIV healed, the creation of the new planet. This is the message that is embedded there, embodied. It is the message of the coming of the Messiah, the celebration that is about to take place above the earth here, which I have already seen, which I have been announcing year on end, which I have been trumpeting, for which I have been calling the nations to repent and return to holiness, for Jesus is holy. I have seen the Messiah coming. Beloved people, prepare the way. I will continue the next time I get a chance to talk about the ark of the covenant of the Lord that I saw in the throne room of God in heaven when the person of the Holy Spirit took me to the throne room of God in heaven. Shalom, the Lord bless you. May you be found holy and ready. Amen. Toda, 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 toda